All right. Welcome, everybody. This is Paul Usowitz with Community Credit Counselors, and I want to welcome you to our September webinar called Check It Out. And we're going to be talking about checking accounts today and uh, debit cards and ATM cards. And so we're certainly happy you took time out of your day to join us. Typically, these are supposed to last about an hour. Last about an hour. Uh, we'll probably get you out of here a little bit before an hour, and we'll go ahead and get started. Again, just again, I am the uh, Bankruptcy Counseling Director here at Community Credit Counselors. Been with the company since about 2005, and um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. So after today, basically, these are what we're going to be able to do. These are our objectives here. The first objective is after today, you're going to be able to state the benefits of using a checking account. You'll be able to, secondly, determine which checking account is best for you. There's all types of checking accounts, as we'll talk about. Third, you'll be able to identify the steps to open a checking account. Fourth, you'll be able to, we'll talk about adding money to a checking account. <clears throat> Fifth, we'll talk about withdrawing money from a checking account. And then sixth, as far as this portion goes, we'll talk about using an automated teller machine and everything involved with that. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and get started with the actual material. All right, now, I am sure most of us, through one time or another, have had a checking account at some point in time. So just want you to take a couple minutes and think to yourself, what, what comes to mind when you think about checking accounts? Is it convenience? Is it, you know, uh, the, abil the ability to uh, fees involved with it? You know, what exactly comes to your mind when you think about checking accounts? Okay, so we're going to talk about the four key benefits of checking accounts. Convenience, cost, better money management, and safety. And we'll start with convenience. Now, checking accounts are convenient because they provide you, number one, with quick and easy access to your money. Paychecks, income tax refunds, and public assistance benefits can be a lot of times direct deposited into your account. And again, direct deposit means that rather than receiving money as a paper check, the money is electronically deposit, deposited into your bank account. Of course, it's faster than being paid via a paper check, and normally you have immediate access to the money. Now, with a checking account, you also have the benefit of using checks and debit cards to make purchases or payments rather than carrying and using cash. Now, of course, then this can reduce your risk of actually losing cash then. All right, so that's the convenience aspect of it. Next, we're going to talk about cost. And, of course, a checking account is usually less expensive than other services, like check cashing services or buying money orders. Let's look at an example comparing the cost of a checking account with the cost of a check cashing service. One of the participants in an earlier class used a check cashing store to cash her, her checks. She cashed four checks a month and was charged $20 each time. That means, obviously, she paid $80 a month or $960 a year if she did it all year for that service. In addition, if she buys money orders to pay five monthly bills and they cost a dollar each, she will pay $60 per year for the cost of the money order. All right. Now we will continue. Bear with me just a moment. The total cost of these transactions per year, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit here, is $1,020, the 960 plus the 60. Now another participant had a checking account. And of course, the bank charged a monthly fee of $5, which included eight free checks per month and free use of the bank's ATM. Ordering a box of 100 checks to get her started cost her $18. So the total annual cost for this checking account is $78. In one year, the cost savings for using a checking account then, instead of a check cashing store, was $942, as you see on your screen. Now, you may be even, a, a, ever, even be able to open a free checking account and receive a box of checks for free which would, of course, save you even more. Remember, it's safe to shop around for the best deal when comparing checking accounts. If you don't like the price of one bank, check with another. We'll talk more about shopping around to find a deal that works for you later in the module. And another hint in mind for when you're ordering checks 
is sometimes you have these services that you can order the checks through a company, and sometimes those are even cheaper than ordering them through the bank itself. All right, moving on then. We're going to continue talking um, about the key benefits of checking accounts. Okay, better money management, of course. Using a checking account can help you manage your money if you regularly record or monitor your transactions. We will talk about how to record transactions in a check register and keep track of the balance in a minute. Transactions are actions that you perform with your account, and that could include anything from uh, depositing or withdrawing money, writing a check or using your debit card to pay bills and make purchases, or having funds directly deposited into your account. Now, maintaining a checking account also allows you to monitor your spending then and make wise spending choices. It also gives you better ability to stick to a spending plan and save money. And it helps you build a positive relationship with your bank for any future transactions, like getting future credit or a loan. And lastly, it does provide a record, because you have a written check, that you pay your bills on time. All right. Let's talk about safety then. All right. It's safer to use checks and debit cards rather than to carry large amounts of cash, of course. Additionally, you can limit your financial loss if you report lost or stolen checks or debit cards to your bank as soon as possible, as soon as you discover the, that you've lost it or the theft. Now, using a checking account at a Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, we all know it is FDIC, uh, can also help you keep your cash safe. What this means is your money is safe up to the insured limit by law if a financial institution closes for any reason and cannot return your money to you. Now you see on the, on the screen there, you can visit the FDIC's Electronic Deposit Insurance Estimator at that website, www.myfdicinsurance.gov, and that lets you calculate the insurance coverage for your accounts at each FDIC insured institution. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is then finding the right checking account for you. All right, now there are several things you can do when looking for the right checking account. First of all, get this is a great one, get recommendations from family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers about the bank they use. Are they happy with it? What are their experiences? So get, recommenda get recommendations from them. Second, determine your checking account needs. What exactly are your needs? We'll talk about that in a moment. And third, compare accounts and the fees charged. Obviously, fees may vary from institution to institution depending upon the type of account it is. So compare that and the fees charged. All right. Financial institutions, again, offer different types of checking accounts. Now, to pick the one that's right for you, think about how you plan to use your checking account. Be sure to choose a bank and an account that is convenient for you and, of course, reasonable in cost. Here are some questions maybe to help you determine what you need in a checking account. For convenience, how many checks do you write per month? Uh, some bank accounts limit the number of checks you can write each month and charge a fee if you exceed that limit. So look at typically how many checks you write in a month, five, six, more than that, a dozen. All right, second, will you use the ATM or teller services often? Does the bank have ATMs or locations close to where you live or work? And how about when you're traveling? Are they nationwide as well? All right. Third, what are the bank's hours of operations? A lot of banks are open evenings and weekends to accommodate customers who work during the day. Fourth, do you plan to do most of your banking online or with a debit card? Uh, many banks offer free online and debit-only services with charges for more than one or two teller visits per month if you do not generally use teller services. Fifth, what online services does the bank offer? Obviously, you can save a lot of time by using online banking if you have access to a computer. I do that all the time. Sixth, what other bank services are important to you? Do you often send money to family out of the country? Do you buy money orders a lot or invest? And can you link your savings account to your checking account to cover overdrafts? Now, overdrafts, or drawing more money out of your account than you have, obviously, can be very expensive. If you have a savings account, even a small one, that links to your checking, 
you may be able to avoid significant overdraft fees. All right, cost, so some cost consideration. How much money will you keep in your account? Some checking accounts waive fees and give additional services for maintaining a minimum balance. Second, will you be charged for writing checks, obviously. Third, will you be charged for online banking or online bill pay? Find out the fees associated with an account. If you don't use a certain service, you might not want an account that charges for that. Also, are you willing to pay a monthly fee? If so, how much? Some accounts, again, depending upon the services that come with them, require a minimum monthly fee. If you do not think you need those services or do not want to pay a fee, then get an account without those fees. Uh, next, will you be charged to use your bank's ATM? Will you be charged for using other banks ATM? I know typically, you know, with some banks, you get charged $2 if you go outside your network, you go to a different bank, and then they charge a, maybe a $250 or $3 fee on top of that. So you end up paying, you know, $5 on maybe a $20 withdrawal. It's, it's, it's crazy. All right. Um, next, will you be charged for using teller services, like we talked about, or contacting customer service? And last, are there ways to avoid paying fees? Be sure you know what fees are charged for various services. If you plan to use an ATM or teller services often, you will not want an account that charges for each use. All right. Types of checking accounts. After you determine what you need in a checking account and understand the fees involved, you must consider what type of an account to open. A few types of checking accounts that banks offers are uh, free and low-cost checking, electronic only and ATM checking, regular checking, or interest-bearing checking. Always read the disclosures, ask questions, and shop around for the best deal before you decide on an account. All right, let's talk about a couple of these in, in a little bit of detail. All right, free low-cost checking. The charge for low-cost checking is often no more than $5 per month. However, this fee may be waived if you use a direct deposit or use your ATM or debit card a minimum number of times per month. Electronic only, ATM checking. This account usually requires you to use direct deposit and your ATM or debit card. The account might be right for you if you handle most of your banking transactions online or via an ATM rather than going into a bank branch. Remember to verify the fees. You may be charged a monthly service charge for not meeting a minimum number of online or electronic transactions, for writing checks, or using in-person teller services. Uh, I remember I had an account with a major bank here locally, and you know, all of a sudden we started getting some, some uh, service fees that they had instituted on the account um, because we didn't keep our balance at a certain minimum. And we did most of ours online and paid, you know, online and used the debit card. We rarely went into the prep bank. So we went to close the account because we had, a, had opened another one at a, at a credit union. And basically they, they were able to give us a different one where as long as we don't go into the branch, as long as we only use our ATM cards and, and only do online banking and transfers and stuff like that, that we wouldn't be charged any fees. So now we have that. It works for us. And we don't. We don't get charged any fees. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regular checking. Again, with a regular checking account, there's usually a minimum balance required to waive the monthly service fee. Again, this normally type offers unlimited check writing privilege. And then you have interest-bearing checking. Uh, with these accounts, you usually have to maintain a high minimum balance, generally at least about $1,000, in order to earn interest and avoid any fees. And there are different types of interest-bearing accounts. There's, there's accounts called negotiable order of withdrawal account, and there's money market deposit accounts as well. All right. Now that we've talked about the different types of checking accounts, um, next thing we're going to talk about then is opening a checking account. Okay. And to open, when you decide to open a checking account, you will be asked normally, number one, to prove your identity. You'll need to show a state-issued driver's license or an ID card. If you're not a citizen of the United States, some banks may accept other both forms of photo ID, including the matricular consular card, the resident alien card or green card, or passport. Typically, any government-issued ID displaying an ID number and the country of issuance is accepted. 
You'll also be, have to provide your Social Security number or individual taxpayer identification number for opening your deposit. All right, and you'll have to have an opening deposit, of course. That's the third one. You know, uh, you have to deposit some funds into the account. Now, when you open your account, you might also be charged for the first box of checks, as we said earlier. The bank may also offer you an ATM or debit card. The bank will then verify you are who you say you are, and they'll have you complete a signature card. And again, a signature card um, excuse me, is a form you complete and sign when opening an account. This is a document that identifies you as the owner of the account, and it identifies what your signature looks like. It helps protect you, of course, and your money against forgeries and unauthorized account use. All right, now identity verification and checking history. The bank performs identity verification, obviously, because it wants to make sure that no one is trying to steal your identity to open an account. This protects you. The bank may also check to see whether you have any outstanding issues with other banks and how you manage your accounts in the past. The bank typically may even pull your credit report to assess your risk as a potential customer. If you have a history of mismanaging your deposit or credit accounts, the financial institution might not be willing to open an account for you. If the bank determines that you are not eligible to open an account, ask about what they call second chance checking programs. Okay. With these programs, let me just wrap up on this, I'm sorry. These programs may require you to meet certain requirements, like completing a check writing workshop. And you ask your local financial institution and or any reputable credit counseling agency if there are programs in your area. Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about very briefly about a check register. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because most of us have filled out a check register uh, if we have a checking account, of course. Hopefully we do. Um, a check register helps you keep track of the money you put into and take out of your checking account. And uh, you see a sample of the check register there on your screen. Uh, obviously, on the register, normally there's space for the check number, whatever the check number is that you use, the date, you want to record the date of each transaction, um, the description of the transaction, whom you wrote the check to, whether it was an ATM deposit or withdrawal, you know, who, who, who it was payable to, what it was for. The record the dollar amount under payment debit of any payments, debits, or withdrawals. If you take cash out of the ATM, record it there. Deposit credit, obviously, that's record the dollar amount of any deposits or credits made to your account. If you get a refund on your debit card, that would go there from maybe an item you return. And then the balance. Add any deposits or credits and then subtract any payments or debits to get the new balance after each transaction and keep a running total of the balance, of course. All right. To understand how to use a check register to keep an accurate record of your transactions, again, we're just going to complete a check register as we work through the remainder of this module. Here's the scenario. You've provided your photo ID. The bank completed the account verification process. You signed the signature card. You're all set to go. You deposit $200 on March 20th to open a checking account and the bank provides you with a receipt for the $200 deposit. Record this on the first row of the practice check register. You'll be using this check register. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some examples here. All right. Enter the date. Let's say March 20th, I think as it says, 2012. The description, opening deposit. The deposit, $200 under deposit credit. And the balance, obviously, you started with zero. You added 200 in there, so you have 200 as your balance. Okay, that's the basics on using a, uh, very briefly on using a check register. All right, now we're going to talk about using money in your checking account, and we're going to talk about depositing money. Again, a lot of basic ideas, I understand that, but we're just going to go through this. Depositing money, we're going to look at four ways to deposit money to your checking account. Number one, you can make a, a cash or check deposit through a teller. You can do a deposit by mail. You can have a direct deposit, remember where it automatically goes into your account. Or you can do an ATM deposit, okay? We're gonna talk about first a cash deposit with a deposit slip. Obviously, to make a deposit using a teller, you must fill out a deposit slip to let the teller know how much you're depositing. They're normally included in your checkbook, the deposit slips, and have your account number printed on them. 
So when making a cash deposit with a deposit slip, number one, make sure the deposit slip has your correct account and address information. If not, write it in the spaces provided. Write in the transaction date. Add up the total cash and write the amount in the correct space. Normally it'll say enter cash in the cash or currency boxes. Give the teller your deposit slip and your cash. The teller will count the money, obviously, before depositing, depositing it into your account. If you run out of deposit slips, you can get blank ones at your bank. Make sure to write your name and account number on the deposit slip if it's a blank, so your money obviously doesn't go into someone else's account. Okay. All right. And there's an example again of a deposit figure filling out. You have $30 in cash. The total is 30. You didn't get any cash back. Um, and your total deposit is $30. You verify all the information. It's right there. Now you record it in your register. Again, bottom line, deposit, the date, $322, $30. Add the 30 to the 200 and now you have a $230 balance. Okay? All right. Next, we're going to talk about a check deposit with a deposit slip. All right. Now, the back of the check, when you get a check and you're going to deposit it, has what it is called an endorsement area. Endorsing a check just basically means signing the back of the check so you can deposit or cash it. If you are depositing the check, you should write the words for deposit only on the, in, in the endorsement area and sign your name. For deposit only prevents others from cashing your check if, the, if it's lost or stolen. When you receive a check as payment and want to cash it, you would only sign your name in the endorsement section You will, if you're just going to take the money out. You will likely need to fill out a deposit slip when depositing checks uh, into your checking account. Uh, if you deposit more than one check, use a separate line to list the amount of each check. Now, if you have more checks that will fit on the front of the, the more, if you have more checks than what will fit on the front of the deposit slip, excuse me, number one, use the back of the deposit slip to list them. Add up the amounts of the checks on the back of the deposit slip. Transfer this total to the front, and then enter this in amount in the box label or total from reverse. Now, when you deposit your check, you can also receive cash back. Net deposit is the amount that will go into your account after you subtract any cash that you're receiving. All right. Now, here's again an example. On March 23rd, you decide to deposit a $50 check and get $25 in cash back. Obviously, you fill in the deposit slip to make your cash deposit. You put down, you know, checks, $50. That's the actual amount of the check. The total is one check, $50. You're taking 25 cash back, so you put that less cash received. Then, obviously, total deposit, $25. All right. So that's when you have a check, whether you're depositing at all or getting cash back. All right. And, of course, don't forget, add that $25 into your total now. You, uh, you know, you deposited 50, as you can see, on 323, that's 280, and it would, you took a withdrawal of $25 out, that's 255 is now your total in your, in, in the, uh, it's now your total. All right, let's talk about direct deposit. Excuse me. All right, direct deposit occurs when your employer or government agency deposit your paycheck or benefits directly into your checking account electronically. You will not receive a check in the mail. A statement showing that your payroll or benefits check was deposited is normally either mailed to you or if you're working, they'll hand it to you at work or it could be emailed to you. The money is immediately available when your bank or credit union opens. Now, some banks will waive monthly fees if direct deposit is used. With direct deposit, uh, it is a safe way, obviously, to receive your money. You can avoid the inconvenience and the expense of depositing or cashing a check. Again, it's an easy and convenient way to access your money, and you can take control of your money and time because direct deposit is predictable and dependable. Now, not all employers offer direct deposit. Let me say that. So ask your employer what options are available to you. If you're a recipient of federal benefits like Social Security or Supplemental Security Income, SSI, you might qualify for an electronic transfer account. 
and you can call 1-800-382-3311 um, uh, or visit www.eta-find.gov slash for more details. And to sign up for a direct deposit of your Social Security or other federal benefits, again, you can contact, contact Go Direct at www.godirect.org or call 1-800-333-1795. So again, direct deposit is a great way to go. Uh, you can actually even have, when you do your tax returns now as well, you can have your uh, tax returns automatically direct deposited into your accounts, typically much quicker. All right, so that's direct deposit. All right, next thing we're going to talk about then, we talked about checks and direct deposit and and uh, other issues with opening accounts. We're going to talk about the ATM, the automated teller machine. Now an ATM allows you to make deposits and withdrawals, of course, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can also use an ATM to check your account balance and transfer money between savings and checking accounts. In order to use an ATM, you must have, though, a personal identification number, commonly called a PIN, for short. Now, PINs are a secret code, usually four digits, which you enter with the keypad on the ATM when you first insert your card into the machine. You should obviously never tell anyone your PIN or write it down where you keep your ATM or debit card. Otherwise, someone could use your PIN and take all the money from your account or up to certain limits. Typically, a lot of times you may be signed an original PIN, and then you can change it to something that is easy for you to remember. Okay? All right. If someone uses your card without permission, however, federal law does protect you. Uh, however, to be fully protected and to minimize your losses, you always want to report lost or stolen ATM or debit cards and or unauthorized charges to your bank immediately. All right, on any ATM, as you see on your screen here, uh, you will find the following parts. There's the ATM screen, which will prompt you through the transaction. B, the slot where you insert the ATM card. Okay. Now, some of the newer ATMs I've noticed, you can, you know, you, you put your card in and it, it, it returns it to you immediately. Others, it'll keep the card until you finish your transaction. It varies upon the financial institution in the ATM machine. Another part is the ATM keypad, which, which you use to respond to the prompts. You know, what do you want to do? Take cash out, deposit, withdraw, transfer. All right, it's the keypad. The next is the, 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 the good one, the slot where the money comes out of or is dispensed. Okay. And then finally, there's the slot where you insert deposits, of course. That's typically separate from where the money is dispensed. Now, not all TM, ATMs, obviously, you look exactly like this one. Banks display instructions on their ATM so you will know how to use them. And if you need help using the ATM at your bank, just ask for assistance when you open your account. All right, talk about ATM deposits. You can use your ATM or debit card to deposit checks or cash at many of your bank's ATMs. Now, with some ATMs, you deposit checks and cash directly into the ATM. Others require you to put your deposit into a deposit envelope provided in a tray or a box that's near the ATM. Of course, be sure to fill in the information listed on the envelope if your bank requests it. This information could include your name, your phone number, your account number, and the deposit amount. Also include a deposit slip in the envelope and insert the envelope into the ATM when it prompts you to do so. Now the mechanics, of course, and I'm sure most of us have made ATM deposits, but to make an ATM deposit, number one, insert your ATM card using the illustration showing you which end of the card to insert first. On some machines, you will insert and remove your card in one motion. Again, as we talked about, other machines will take your card until the end of the transaction. Second, follow the prompts to deposit your money. Typically, you're going to enter in your PIN number, the four-digit PIN. You're then going to select Deposit from the touchscreen menu or the appropriate button to the side of the screen. You'll then use the keypad to enter the amount you are depositing. Always double check that before you hit, uh, just to make sure, because some of them will automatically put the decimal. And if you're depositing, you know, $400, you want to make sure it says $400 before you finalize it, and that you didn't uh, just put like $40 in there. All right, insert the cash or checks as directed. 
Some ATMs now have electronic readers. If you insert your cash or checks, it will automatically count and add the amount for you. For this type of machine, you do not need a deposit slip, typically. After that, the machine may ask if you want to complete another transaction if you want a receipt. If you want another transaction, press yes. If not, press no. Last step, do not forget to take your ATM card if the ATM returns it at the end of a transaction. The ATM may retrieve it within several minutes if you do not take it. However, if someone is behind you, they may be able to get your card and use it fraudulently. If you experience problems with the machine or forget to take your ATM card, contact your bank as soon as possible. All right, and I've had that happen, not to me, but when my wife and I pulled up to an ATM, there was somebody's card that they had driven off and, um, and left it there. We were right behind them. Um, you know, we pulled it, we tried to catch them, we couldn't, so we called their bank and financial institution from the back of the card, and, and they issued them a new card, and they told us just to destroy the card, which we did. All right. All right, so that's that. Now we're going to talk about uh, ways to take money out of your account. We're going to talk about three ways to take money out of your checking account. Number one, you can write a check. Number two, you can use an ATM. Or three, you can use the teller service and a withdrawal slip. All right, steps to writing a check. A check, again, is a written contract between you and your bank. When you write a check, you're asking the bank to take money from your account and give it to somebody else. So there are three steps you need to take when writing a check, as you see on your screen. First of all, Obviously, make sure you have enough money in your account. Second, complete all the blank spaces on the check. And third, obviously, you want to record the transaction in your check register. All right. Make sure you have enough money, step one. We're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, how do you know if you have enough money in your account? Basically, look in the balance column of your check register. Other options may include view, viewing your account balance at an ATM or online before you write the check. That's why it's important to record every deposit and withdrawal you make in your check register. When you do this, you can be sure that the amount in the balance column accurately reflects what you have in your account. If you use a debit card, you can review your statements online to ensure your balance is accurate. Some merchants use a system that allows your paper check to clear immediately just as if you had used your debit card. This helps prevent people from writing checks when they do not really have the money to pay for their purchases. It's a very bad idea to try to beat the bank by writing a check when you know you don't have enough money in, in your account to cover it, and then trying to deposit money before the bank receives the check. Do not put your account and your finances in jeopardy this way. Always have enough money in your account before you write the check. Okay. And with the passage we talked about in prior sessions of that Check 21 Act, which basically that's the act that allows checks to pretty much clear immediately from your account. And if you've ever gone into a, a, a place to pay for something and they take your check, but then they end up processing electronically and giving you your check back, that's typically the Check 21. So bottom line, always make sure you have enough money in there. All right. All righty. Excuse me. Step two, complete the check, obviously. After you, after you know you have enough money in there, you want to complete the check. Again, pretty basic ideas, but to write the check, you'll need to fill in the date. Uh, be sure you write the complete date, including the month, day, and year. Pay to the order up. This is where you're going to obviously write the name of the person or company to whom you will give the check. After writing the name, always draw a line to the end of the space so nobody can put any an additional name or anything else on your check. Three, the dollar amount of your check in numbers. Example, $19.75 with a dollar sign, 19.75. Fourth, you'll put the dollar amount of the check in words. And again, after writing out the amount of the check, if you have room left, draw a line to the end. This prevents anyone from adding an additional amount after what you've written. And then five, I find this helpful in the memo section. Writing this is optional. Um, uh, you can use it to remind yourself of the reason you wrote the check or to record the account number of the bill that you're paying. And then very important, the last one, the signature line. Don't forget to sign the check. That's where you sign your name. All right, now keep these tips when, in mind when writing checks. Obviously, you know, you want to write in black or blue ink. You want to write clearly. 
and you want to remember to record each check you write in your check register. You might want to use carbon copy checks so that you have a copy of the checks you write. It will be easier to verify that you've entered all the transactions into your check register with that type. Okay, we're going to talk about when you get your first box of checks, pre-printed information. And when you receive your first box of checks, um, you know, you're going to have information already printed on the checks. Normally that includes your name and address. And your phone number can be included at your request as well. The check number and codes. This number identifies each check you write. Uh, it's up in the top right part of the screen. Your bank's name, obviously, will be on it, your financial institution. Routing numbers. This is a computerized bank ID number, usually in the lower left-hand corner of the check, and it's normally always nine digits long. And then next to that is your account number. This is, again, the computerized number following the routing number, usually at the bottom of the check to the right of the routing number. Word of caution, do not have your Social Security or your driver's license number pre-printed on your checks because of the risk of identity theft. Okay. Now we're going to talk about actually writing a check. We have an example, I think, on there next. Um, uh, on March 26th, you decide you want to buy a coffee maker from a store called Coffee Mart. Imagine that. The coffee maker costs $19.75, including tax. Look, look, at your, look at the check register we have there. Uh, obviously, do you have enough money in your checking account to write a check for the coffee maker? Yes, there's $200 in the checking account. Fill it out with the information again. Your name, payable to Coffee Mart, the amount, $19.75. Write it out, $19.75 with a line to the end. Memo, new coffee maker. Don't forget to sign it. If you make a small mistake, you can cross out the incorrect information, and always they're going to request that you put your initials above what you crossed out. Then again, complete the check. Note that some stores will not accept checks with crossed out information. If you make a large mistake, uh, for example, writing the wrong amount, then just write void across the check. Start over. You might prefer to tear or shred the check to prevent thieves from stealing confidential information from it. So just write void and start all over again with a new check. All right. Now we must record the transaction, the purchase in your check register. Here's the information. Again, you put the check number, the date, the description of the transaction, coffee mart, the payment amount under payment debit 1975. You subtract out the 1975 from your previous balance, and according to this, then you have a balance of 235 and a quarter left. All right. All righty. We're kind of getting towards the end a little bit here. So uh, next thing we're going to talk about is writing a check for cash. Sometimes we need to do this. We need cash, and we can't get to the ATM for some reason, so we have to write a check. Here, if you want to write, use a check to get cash out of your account, number one, write check cash or your name in the pay to the order of area on your check and present it to your teller at the bank. Don't forget to sign it. Do not write a check for cash until you are in the bank. If you write it before then and you happen to lose it on the way, then, of course, anyone can cash the check. Hopefully, they'll still ask for identification, but anyone could cash the check. Like writing any other check, obviously, remember to record the withdrawal in your check register. All right, we're going to move on. How to withdraw money from the ATM. Uh, and again, we've already kind of talked about this. Just you know, insert your ATM card using the illustration showing you which end of the card to insert first. On some machines you will insert and again remove your card in one motion. Others will keep your card till the end of the transaction. Then follow the prompts to withdraw the money. You enter your PIN number on the keypad. You select withdraw from the touch screen menu or the appropriate button to the side of the screen. You use the keypad to enter the desired withdraw amount. Most ATMs give funds in multiples of ten or twenty dollars. And again, before you hit enter, or before you, you know, finalize it, make sure it's the right amount, that the decimals are in the right point. If you want to withdraw $20 and you actually put $2,000 in there and you don't look at it, that could cause some issues, especially if you don't have the $2,000 in the account. So always double check. Then after you do that and hit enter, you retrieve your money from the cash slot. The ATM, again, may, watch, may prompt you to see if you want to do another transaction or if you would like a printer receipt. If you want another transaction, hit yes. If not, hit no. If you want a receipt, hit yes. All right. 
If you make any mistakes when entering the information, you may be able to press either clear to re-enter the information or cancel to cancel the transaction and start over. And I've done that before. I'm at one bank, I have two banks, and I put in my card, and I actually put in my, start to put in my PIN number from the other one, which isn't going to do me any good, and I realized I screwed up, so I just hit cancel or clear, and I can enter in the correct PIN number. And don't forget to take your money in the ATM card. That's the reason you went there. So don't forget to take it, and also don't forget your card. All right, a little note about ATM fees now. You may need to monitor your ATM transactions, especially if you are limited to a certain number of transactions before you're charged a monthly fee. Be aware of you, the, what the fees the bank charges for another bank's ATM in addition to the fee the other institution may impose, like we talked about at the beginning of the session. Again, for example, if you withdraw $20 from another bank, your bank may charge you up to $3 for using another bank's ATM, and the other bank may charge you a $3 fee. That means you'll be withdrawing $20 and paying $6 in fee, which, again, is an equivalent of 30%. And also be careful not to overdraw your account, as you may incur NSF or overdraft fees. You can remember that to record all ATM transactions and fees in your check register to avoid overdrawing your account. All right. Let's, all right, let's start with what we learned about in this first part. Uh, we learned about the benefits of having a checking account instead of using a check cashing service. It'll save you a lot of money. Second thing, the types of checking accounts available. Figure out which one's best for you. Watch the fees. Third, how to open a checking account, what documents you'll need, things like that. Fourth, we talked about simply how to write a check. Fifth, how to use ATM and debit cards, how to make deposits and withdrawals, and of course, how to keep accurate records. All right, part two, briefly, we're going to cover, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about using electronic banking to kind of wrap up today. Now, electronic banking uses computers to move money to and from your bank account instead of checks and other paper transactions. Examples of electronic banking could include, we already talked about automatic teller or ATM transactions with the use of an ATM or debit card. You can use automatic bill pay, online bill pay, or cell phone banking, even in today's world of cell phones. Now, most banks provide electronic banking services in which you can access your bank account from a computer or cell phone. Many provide these services for free, while others may charge a fee. Uh, when you open your checking account, ask your bank what electronic or online services it provides. Common services include um, uh, statements and alerts you can get online or electronically, money transfers, deposits, and withdrawals, bill payment services, debit card replacement and check ordering, account maintenance and information, and customer service via email or online chat. Now, Internet commerce is fast and convenient, but as with the old-fashioned ways of doing business, it pays to take the precautions discussed through this module. Let me back up a minute. I kind of skipped over. Uh, at basically, our objectives, we're going to be able to list the four types of electronic banking services. We're going to explain how debit cards are linked to checking accounts and we're going to talk about recording fees and transactions in your check register. Okay, we're also going to be able to explain overdraft fees and how they affect your checking account. And we're going to reconcile a check register with the bank statement, and then finally describe how to manage a checking account wisely. Okay, all right, I kind of skipped around a little bit on that, I'm sorry. Uh, we talked about the electronic banking, what that includes, so we're just going to move right on through. All right, now let's get to debit cards. Again, we've already talked about this, so I'm just going to be brief. With a debit card, you can withdraw cash from an ATM, or you can use it to make purchases at retail locations. Again, you must have a personal identification number to complete electronic debit card transactions. All right, um, they, they generally feature a Visa or MasterCard logo, so you can make debit or credit purchases where these cards are accepted. And again, you have to enter your PIN number, whereas with a credit purchase, you may only have to sign the merchant receipt. Okay, again, with the PINs, they're a secret code. Keep it safe. Don't write it down anywhere on your card or anywhere else. And again, there are penalties if somebody does use your card without permission. Um, uh, federal law does protect you, bottom line. 
Okay. All right. Uh, if you have an issue that happens where the funds are withdrawn uh, out of your account, uh, if you report the problem promptly, again, the financial institution normally will put the money back into your account, less $50, if it's unable to resolve the matter within 10 business days. You have to report errors within two business days of discovering them to be fully protected under federal law. Some banks may voluntarily waive all of your liability for unauthorized transactions if you took reasonable care to avoid fraud or theft. With a credit card, you don't have to pay the disputed transaction while the company that issued the credit card is investigating the matter. If someone uses your credit card without your permission after it's lost or stolen, federal law limits your losses to a maximum of $50, although industry practices may further limit your losses. I'm also going to talk briefly here about temporary holds with a debit card. When you swipe a card for purchase where the exact amount is not known, Example, maybe at a hotel when re or when reserving a rental car. A temporary hold is sometimes placed on funds in your account until the actual transaction posts to the account. The hold will likely be for an amount greater than you actually spend. This temporary hold could prevent you from buying other things even if you do have the money available. For example, maybe you imagine you have $200 in your checking account. You use your debit card to reserve a hotel room that costs $100. If the hotel places a temporary hold on the funds in your account for the amount of $200, you will have no money available to use until the hotel posts the charges to your account or releases the hold. Many car rental companies and hotels all allow you to use debit cards to reserve a car or room as well. The temporary hold amount is generally more than the cost of the car or room and can last several days. When making travel reservations, be sure to ask about the debit card hold policy. All right, debit versus credit cards. Whether you use your debit card, whenever you use it, always ensure, that, again, there's enough money in your account to avoid being overdrawn. Unlike credit cards, which allow you to make purchases now and pay for them later, debit cards deduct the amount from your checking account as soon as you make the purchase. If you have insufficient funds or not enough funds in your account to cover the transaction, you can incur costly overdraft fees. Okay. All right. Let's talk about automatic bill payment then next. Automatic bill payment transfers money electronically from your account to pay your bills automatically on the designated payment dates. Be sure to check with your financial institution because this service may not be free with all accounts. If you use automatic bill pay, you do not have to pay for postage or worry about late payments. However, make sure, again, you have enough money in your account to cover your bills when they are due and keep track of the account balance. A bill may be higher than anticipated, let's say a utility bill in the summer or winter, and you could risk with overdrawing your account if you do not have enough money to cover the bill or transactions made after the bill is processed. Check your bills regularly to ensure the bill is accurate and the payment is made. You may be responsible for late payments if the bill is not paid automatically as anticipated. Online bill payment. This is different from automatic bill payment in that you designate when bills are paid from your account each month. There are several ways you can pay bills online. You may be able to pay bills from your online banking account, through a budgeting software program, and or by creating an online account with your service provider, like a electronic, your electric bill, your water bill, your cable company. If you pay bills online, you may need to, one, enter the payee's name, your account number, and other information related to the bill or company being paid. Second, you may need to enter your form of payment, obviously, and your payment amount. And you're going to click the payment option. Example, pay or send payment and or also authorize the payment. Okay. Let's talk about cell phone mobile banking. Depending upon the services offered by your financial institution and your cell phone service provider, you may be able to conduct the following banking transactions from your cell phone. Uh, you might be able to receive text message alerts when your account balance reaches a certain level or when a certain transaction occurs. You might be able to check with your cell, check with your cell phone provider service provider regarding fees for sending and receiving text messages if they're not covered in your plan. You would want to sign up for something if you're going to you have to pay a lot of fees each time you get a text. Access your online bank account to check balances, pay bills, and transfer funds between accounts. 
It also allows you to locate your bank's closest ATMs on your cell phone, perhaps, and also maybe to pay for purchases. As with a regular landline telephone, you can also call your bank to conduct many transactions. Um, for example, checking your account balances, determine whether checks, transactions have cleared, and transfer money between accounts. Uh, you can do those on your cell phone as well. All right. So we've talked a lot about that. All right. Safe electronic banking. The Internet offers convenient new ways to shop for financial services and conduct banking transactions any day, any time. However, safe electronic banking involves making wise choices that will help you avoid costly surprises, scams, or identity theft. Some precautions you can take include using a secure and encrypted connection to the Internet. You want to disregarding fraudulent emails asking you to send your account number, your password, or any personal information via email. Legitimate financial institutions do not ask for this information via email. You can confirm that an online bank is legitimate at www.fdic.gov. You, you can monitor your bank. Obviously, you want to monitor your bank account activity closely. Uh, keep your information private. Contacting your bank to find out more precautions you can take with the online and mobile banking services they offer. And of course, using an antivirus software, keeping it updated to detect and the, and the block spyware and other malicious attacks, and using a firewall to stop hackers from accessing your computer. All right, we're going to wrap up this part by talking about steps to keeping accurate account records. Again, keeping an accurate record of your checking account activity is very important. It helps you to know at all times the exact amount of money you have in your checking account. To keep an accurate record of your checking account activity, you should, one, Record all transactions, as we've said, in your check register or budgeting software. Two, record maintenance fees, interest, and other bank charges. Three, review your monthly checking account statements. And four, reconcile your checking register with monthly checking account statements. You should get a receipt when you use a debit card, as far as receipts go, to buy goods or perform electronic banking transactions. If the merchant cannot give you a receipt, or if you forget to get a receipt, promptly record the amount um, so that you can record and track the expense later. Remind, remember that all purchases, even small ones, add up. You can avoid costly overdraft fees by recording transactions and monitoring your current account balance regularly. When using an ATM, make it a practice to always get a receipt. Again, printed receipts usually include the amount of the transaction, any extra fees, the date, the type of transaction, example deposit or withdrawal, a code for your account or ATM card, and the available balance. The, it'll also normally include the ATM location or an ID code of the terminal used and the name of the bank or the merchant where you made the transaction. Okay, so just record all transactions also next in your check register. Again, um, you know, we've talked about that it's enough. If you do not regularly monitor your banking transactions and account balance online, again, you should record all transactions in your register or, in the, or enter them in into a budgeting software program. If you have a joint account or if other family members have an ATM or a debit card and that's attached to your checking account, make sure you also record their transactions. And again, obviously a check register helps you to keep track of the money you put into and take out of your account. We've already had a sample of the check register and what you need to put on there. So, um, you know, so I'm not going to really go over that again. All right. And we've talked about completing your check register. So just make sure you put all the information in as you see the example on the screen. And, you know, whether it's a payment, whether it's a deposit, or and what your balance is, make sure you subtract it out from there as well. Okay. Again, also make sure that you record any interest or fees in your account. Maybe when you get your statement, it'll tell you what the monthly fee is, or if you check it online, make sure you put that. In the example, there's a monthly fee of $5, and subtract that from your balance as well. So you always want to record those interest and fees. Okay, let's talk to wrap up this session on checking account statements. Each month, you're going to receive a checking account statement from your bank. It will list all transactions that occurred during the preceding month. And again, these may include cash checks, withdrawals and deposits, debit card purchases, 
or interest earned or fees charged. Now, checking account statements do vary from bank to bank. If you have any questions, ask your bank customer service rep. Now we'll look at a sample checking account statement. Most checking account statements will show your bank's name and address, two, the time period covered by the statement, three, your, your name and address, four, your account number, five, a list of transactions by date, six, a list of all cash checks in numerical order by the check number. Some banks do not provide this, by the way. And seven, a statement summary including fees and charges, if any. All right. Now, let's talk about reconciling your checking account. Balancing your checkbook means keeping your checkbook register up to date by recording all transactions and maintaining totals so you always know how much money is in your account. When you get your monthly statement, you may notice a difference between the statement balance and your check register. This difference may occur if, number one, you did not record some of the transactions listed on the bank statement, or two, some of your recorded transactions were posted after the bank statement was prepared and sent to you. Reconciling your checking account helps you find the reasons for the differences and make any necessary corrections. Okay. We will review two steps or two different ways of reconciling your checking account. All right. Whenever you reconcile your check register, you must compare it with the monthly checking account statement. Again, uh, we have a sample there right now. Uh, what is the checking account statement balance? Uh, see new balance or ending balance on the statement. All right. Um, does it match the balance on your practice check register? Okay. All right. To reconcile the two balances and find out why they are different, again, number one, compare your check register with the monthly statement. Put a small check mark beside each item in your check register that matches an item on your statement. Any, are there any items that are listed on the monthly account statement that do not appear on the check register? If so, which ones? All right. All right. In answer, in our scenarios, yes, the $25 withdrawal is missing on the check register. Add the missing transactions to your check register below the last transaction. Calculate the balance by adding deposits or subtracting withdrawals from your check register balance. And what's the new balance in your check register? The answer is $80.25. Does that match the checking account statement balance? Yes. All right. So that is just that was just an example there. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about to wrap up here, correcting errors on your statements and overdraft fees, and, we're, and that'll be it. All right, if you find an error on your statement, you want to call, write, or visit your bank as soon as you find an error on your bank statement. If you call or visit your bank, it is a good idea to follow up by writing a letter. Keep a copy of the letter for your records. It should include your name, your account number, an explanation and dollar amount of the error, the date the error occurred, any conversations and the outcomes with bank personnel regarding this error, and always write down who you spoke with. The bank statement, the bank must receive notice of the error no later than 60 days after the date of the statement. Okay. All right. We have discussed the importance of monitoring transactions and reconciling your checking register with your account statement so that you can avoid costly overdraft fees. We're going to talk about overdraft fees now. An overdraft occurs, again, when you don't have enough money in your account to cover a transaction, or in other words, you try to withdraw more money than your checking account than you actually have available to spend. Again, assume you have $10 in your account. The phone company electronically debits your $50 bill from your account as you ask them to do every month. If you have an overdraft program linked to your account, the bank would pay the bill and charge you an overdraft fee, perhaps around $35. If you do not have an overdraft program linked to your account and you overdraw, the bank would decline the payment or return a check, where applicable, to the phone company. The bank and the phone company may charge you a non-sufficient funds or returned item fee, which could range anywhere from $15 to $50. Either way, your balance would fall below zero and would overdraft your account. This can happen very easily if you do not reconcile your checking account or pay attention to what you spent. If it happens to you, you will need to make a deposit into your account to replace the amount you withdrew 
plus cover fees to bring your balance positive again. Obviously, you want to do it as quickly as possible, as the bank might charge you interest or additional fees the longer your account balance is negative. Okay, the bank, there are some opt-in rules for some ATM or debit card transactions. Um, the bank will ask you how to handle certain overdrafts generated by ATM withdrawals and one-time debit card transactions at store point-of-sales terminals, POS as they're called. If you opt in to a bank's overdraft program, you agree to it, let's say, the bank can charge you a fee, perhaps $30 or more, to process point-of-sale or ATM transactions that exceed your account balance. Then overdrafts and the fee will be deducted immediately in full from your next deposit. These deductions will lower your account balance and may increase the risk of more overdrafts. If you do not opt in, the bank will decline your ATM withdrawals and debit card transactions at POS terminals if you do not have enough money in your account to cover the withdrawal or purchase. You will not be charged fees. They'll just be declined. Remember, the opt-in rule applies only to ATM and certain debit card transactions. So even if you do, do not opt in to overdraft coverage for certain uh, ATM POS transactions, the bank may still charge you overdraft fees for other types of transactions, such as the checks or for bills you automatically pay through your debit card every month. All right. Check overdrafts. If you write a check without enough money in your account to cover the check, it's known as writing a bad check or bouncing a check. All right. If you, um, stores likely will charge you a fee when you write them a check. Um, and without having enough money in your account to cover it. The fee charge is usually posted near the cashier. As we saw earlier, your bank would also likely charge you an NSF fee. Knowingly writing a bad check or doing so with fraudulent intent obviously is a crime in every state. Each state has different civil and criminal penalties. penalties. For this reason, if you ever do mistakenly write a bad check, correct it as soon as possible. If you repeatedly overdraw your account, your bank may close your account uh, and report negative checking account activity to an account verification company. This can make it difficult to cash or write checks and also open bank accounts in the future. What should you do if a bank turns you away from a customer as a customer because of an unfavorable report on your bank account? Um, number one, ask the bank for the name, address, and the phone number of the company that furnished the report. Two, request a free copy and look for and correct any incorrect or missing information. If your bank was the source of an error in your check report, the bank must contact the check reporting service and have it corrected. If you dispute the matter in writing and the check reporting company does not change the record to your satisfaction, you are entitled to add a written statement to your report. If you have a concern involving a bank or a check reporting service, contact the appropriate federal regulator or in the case of check reporting services, the Federal Trade Commission or FTC. All right, bank overdraft. Um, programs. Overdrafting your, your account, as we talked about, can be expensive. The best way to avoid overdraft and NSF fees is to remember to keep good records and check how much money you have in your checking account before making withdrawals or purchases. Still, it can be a good, a good time, a uh, good idea rather, to take time to learn what options you have to handle the rare situation when you might spend more than you have in your account. Again, options may include linking your checking account to your savings account. So the overdrawn amount is taken from your savings account. All right. Also linking your savings account to a line of credit. You will pay interest on any balance you carry, and you may be charged an annual fee. Uh, the sooner you pay off the money you borrow, the less you will pay in interest. So this option may be less expensive than traditional fee-based overdraft options. And also enrolling in an overdraft program for which you either pay a monthly fee or a per item charge, which could be $35 or more per item. Fees can be add up quickly. If you use these repeatedly, they can become a very expensive form of credit. Also with many of these programs, the bank doesn't guarantee you that it will cover any or all overdrafts. Okay, all right. Last thing we're gonna do here is we have an overdraft scenario. Lisa spent $150. She only had $125 in her account. She was charged a $30 overdraft fee. All right. By how much did Lisa overdraft her account? $55, obviously. If Lisa gets paid in three days and the bank charges her $5 a day for every day she's overdrawn, 
How much will now we add up by the time her check is deposited? Another $15. When Lisa receives her paycheck for $8.65, what will her new balance be? Obviously, you take the $8.65 minus the $70, so her new balance will be $7.95. Hoping you will not overdraw your account, but if this occurs, remember that the amount you deposit will be reduced by the amount you have overdrawn. Be sure to account for that when you reconcile your checkbook. Okay. All right. So how can you avoid overdraft fees? Keep your check register updated. Pay attention to electronic transactions. Remember to record automatic payments and drafts and checks. Keep track of your account balance and always review your statements monthly. All right. And we went a little bit longer than an hour. I apologize. Uh, but we learned about electronic banking, reconciling an account, talked about overdraft and line of credit programs, debit cards in your checking account, and how to manage your checking account wisely. All right, that's going to wrap it up today. Again, I appreciate your patience with us today. We hope you learned a lot about checking accounts and debit cards and ATM cards and overdraft fees. Um, we want to thank you for attending today. We look forward to you to, for you to join us next month for Money Smarts, Money Matters, How to Keep Track on Your Money of your money, rather. And as always, join us on Facebook. Uh, you can go to www.facebook.com slash community credit counselors or follow us on Twitter at CCCI Tweets. So I thank everybody for joining us today, um, and hopefully you'll join us next month. We look forward to that. And just check our Facebook status for updates. All right, everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you.